In mid-November 1943, the Fifth Guards Army was tasked to prepare and conduct an offensive operation to break through the German defences in the area Zipkoye Petrozagory, in cooperation with the left flank formations of the 53rd Army, to defeat the Alexandria Znamenskaya grouping of the enemy and seize Alexandria and Znamenka. The enemy had here a deeply echelon defence, consisting of two strips. The first, the main, consisted of three positions. At a distance of 13-15 kilometres from the front line was preparing the second defensive strip, the construction of which involved the local population. The 32 Antgwards Rifle Corps of General A. I. Rodimtsev, which, as the reader remembers, included our 97th Guards Rifle Division. The beginning of the offensive was scheduled for six oars on November 20th, and after a powerful artillery preparation lasting three hours and 15 minutes, battalions of the first echelon were to rise to the attack. The day before I spent with the commanders of battalions and companies, with the commanders of attached units reconnaissance of the terrain, organised interaction and gave them a verbal combat order. In the first echelon attacked the first and third rifle battalions, in the second, the second battalion. The company of machine gunners left in his reserve. A regimental artillery group was created, which included all regimental artillery and an attached division from the artillery regiment of the division. The regiment was allocated four T-34 tanks for direct support of the infantry. Not much, of course, but we could not count on more. I distributed them among the battalions of the first echelon, two tanks each. It was quite clear to me that during the attack, the riflemen would fall behind the tanks. There was no way to run on the rain-soaked ground. What if we put the gunners on the armour? I expressed my opinion to the deputy regimental commander Major Polterak, the deputy in the formation of Captain Cherve, and the chief of staff of the regiment Major Takmovtsev, when we all together in the evening once again discussed the details of the upcoming battle. Not a bad idea, supported me, Chief of Staff. From the company of machine gunners can take 30 people. My deputies also agreed with this proposal. I told my adjutant to summon to the CP battalion commanders Captain Ananenko and Major Balkvadze, the commander of the company of machine gunners Senior Lieutenant Mikarov, as well as Lieutenant Tankers commanders of tank platoons. When they all came, I told them the essence of the case, set specific tasks for each of them. It had not yet dawned when the sky split from volleys of Katyusha and shots of hundreds of guns and mortars. Artillery preparation ended at 9.15, and at the same minute I gave the signal, the beginning of the attack. It was already quite light, and from the base I could see well, even without binoculars, how the guardsmen under cover of the fire of four tanks and escort guns went into the attack, with difficulty pulling their feet out of the mud. As I had expected, the tanks with the troops on board overtook the infantry and approached the first trench a few minutes earlier. They turned along it and from machine guns hit the Germans sitting there. The machine gunners jumped off the armour and opened fire with machine guns, pelted the trench with grenades, again climbed on the tanks, which rushed to the second trench. At that time the riflemen arrived, some of them stayed to finish off the fascists, and the rest followed the tanks. By 15 o'clock the first position of the German defence was broken through and the regiment took possession of height 192.6. The enemy made a number of counter-attacks to knock us down from this height, but without success. During the first day of fighting the regiment advanced 10 kilometres, that day, I signed a lot of award sheets. Just 12 days before, on November 8, 1943, the Order of Glory of Three Degrees was established by the decree of the Presidium of the Supreme Soviet of the USSR. And the first of our regiment to the Order of Glory of the Three Degree were presented to the Order of Glory of the Komsomol Riflemen, Guard Senior Sergeants, and Rudich I.A. Antipin, A.P. Babishkin, Guard Sergeants A.E. Kuznetsov, M.I. Redkin, Guards Junior Sergeant N. E. Palgov, Guards Privates D. P. Pedorenko, G. F. Rakitsky and X. Mustafayev. And in early December they were already awarded orders. When repelling enemy counterattacks on the height of 192.6, 
distinguished themselves commander of the Rifle Platoon Guards Junior Lieutenant G. V. Pampuka, who bravely and decisively led the battle, replacing the company commander who was out of service, Mortar Platoon Commander Guards Junior Lieutenant A. A. Ustin, who opened accurate fire on the attacking enemy armoured gunner, Guards Private I. S. Avgitov, who destroyed the enemy. S. Avgitov, who destroyed two enemy armoured personnel carriers, they were awarded the Order of the Red Star. On November 21 and 22, we continued the offensive in the direction of Pavlish and Onofrivka. For four days, there were persistent battles in the area of these settlements. The rate of advance of our troops decreased to three to five kilometres per day, so desperately resisted the Germans, fearing encirclement at Alexandria and Znamenka and only on the night of November 25 managed to storm Onufrievka, and two days later the enemy hit the units of the 33rd Guards Rifle Corps operating to the south of us with the forces of two infantry and two tank divisions. Our corps was ordered to strike at these enemy divisions from the north. In these battles, the 289th Guards Regiment had to act in the first echelon of the division and to conduct several counter-battles with the enemy. Especially intense were the battles near the village of Kambalievka. Our scouts during the night search penetrated into this village and took two prisoners who showed that Kambalievka was defended by the 241st Infantry Regiment of the 106th Infantry Division, about 800 men. The 1st Rifle Battalion attacked the village north of the two mounds, knocked out the enemy from there and broke through to the southern outskirts. But here the battalion was surrounded communication with him was cut off. I reported to the division commander about this and my decision to send to the rescue of the 3rd Rifle Battalion, which was in the 2nd Echelon. General Ansiferov approved my decision and promised to support this battalion with fire. During the day, the 3rd Battalion tried three times to make its way to the encircled, but was unable to do so. The situation became critical when the enemy threw against the small 1st Battalion more than a company of infantry on armoured personnel carriers with large calibre machine guns and three tanks. Our soldiers, fighting in the encirclement, ran out of ammunition. They fought back with grenades, went into hand-to-hand -hand combat, but the forces were too unequal. Only Captain Anonenko and a few dozen soldiers managed to escape. When I reported to the division commander on the results of the unsuccessful battle, my mood was, of course, worse than ever. I did not hide the fact that it was my fault too. It means that I had poorly organised the battle, did not take into account that the enemy had reserves not revealed by reconnaissance. This is the second hard lesson for the regiment after Kaskui land on the Dnieper. Comrade General. I told the commander then, it is difficult to vow for the future, but I will try to fight smarter. The sword does not cut the guilty head, people say, and maybe that's why Ivan Ivanovich and Sifarov limited that time that announced me a verbal reprimand and let me go, as they say with God, not failing to say goodbye. Look, Naumenko, next time we'll not get off so easily. I understood, of course, the commander could have punished me more severely. He just discounted the fact that I took the regiment less than two months ago. But I punished myself in my heart. It was because of my ill-considered, tactically immature decision that dozens of soldiers and commanders were out of action that day. In the battles for Kambuleyevka, many soldiers of the regiment showed courage and bravery. The commander of the 1st Machine Gun Company, Guards Lieutenant N. A. Linkoff, during the reflection of the German counter-attack himself, lay down behind the machine gun and killed many fascists. Next to him, machine gunner of the guards private N. A. Kanoff was firing aptly. The gun commander of the 76mm battery, Guards Sergeant T. N. Antashkevich, noticed that the Germans rolled their cannon to an open position. However, not a single shot was fired by the enemy gun. The calculation of Guard Sergeant Antashkevich destroyed it together with the servants. And in this no small merit of the gunner, Guards Private I. N. Mamonov. In the last days of November, the 289th, Guards Rifle Regiment advanced in the direction of Vasilievka, E. Katerinovka, Alexeevka, Zamfirivka. 
Stubborn battles with the enemy did not stop for a single day. Sometimes some strongholds changed hands several times during the day. Even the extremely concise language of combat reports preserved the flavour of the fierce battles of those days. Here is a combat report I sent to the division headquarters at 1530 on November 29th, being at the regiment's CP, located on the southern outskirts of Belaya Glinka. The enemy by nine Puerzoul concentrated up to 40 tanks and armoured vehicles, including eight Tigers. During the first half of the day, his aviation was very active, making more than 120 airplane sorties. At 11.30, a group fire was shot down an enemy plane, which was conducting reconnaissance in the area of height 144.3. Regiment 3 battalions at 12.0 went on the offensive. At 12.30, the enemy with 10 tanks and armoured vehicles tried to counterattack the 3rd Rifle Battalion. The counterattack was repulsed. The enemy lost four tanks, of which one was burned and three were hit, including one Tiger. Two tanks were taken out of action by Miroshnichenko's and Marusich's PTR calculations from the 3rd Rifle Battalion. One tank was hit by a battery of 45mm guns, a battery of 120mm mortars hit two armoured personnel carriers and two vehicles. By 15 hours due to heavy machine gun fire of the enemy, as well as the fire of 15 tanks, which are between the mounds 3 and 4 and height 147.6, the regiment could not advance, fixed on the achieved line. Enemy losses, tanks, 4, armoured personnel carriers, 3, vehicles, 2, shot down one plane. More than 60 soldiers and officers of the enemy were killed and wounded. How many such combat reports passed through my hands during the war? It's hard to count. And behind each of them, the feet of soldiers, sergeants, officers who spared neither blood nor life itself to defeat the enemy. So, the Battle of November 29th. When the Germans went into a counter-attack, our mortars and machine gunners with accurate fire cut off the infantry from the tanks and forced it to lie down. Armoured gunners of Officer Kargopolov hit the enemy vehicles with friendly fire. Having let the tanks at a close distance, Miroshnichenko's and Marusich's crews shot down one car each. The second numbers of these units, Rudobashka and Ignatenko, acted skillfully. Two German armoured cars crawled out of the beam. Mortar crews Kropotkin and Bakhterev hit them as soon as they began to climb the height. For this, mortars needed only a dozen mines. On this day, the gun crew of Guards Staff Sergeant Morozov from an open position hit another German tank, an armoured car, an armoured personnel carrier and four trucks. The gun commander and all the gunners, guards privates Marinich, Popov, Yuldashev, Bondar and Klishev, were awarded the Order of Glory, third degree. Before each serious battle or fight in the primary party, organisations received applications for admission to the party. I want to go into battle as a communist. Such a phrase was in almost every application. And before the battle on November 29th, the party organisation of our regiment was replenished at the expense of soldiers who distinguished themselves in previous battles. The commander of the company of machine gunners, Guards Senior Lieutenant P. I. Mikarov, was accepted as a member of the party. Candidates for membership in the All-Union Communist Party of Bolsheviks, Guards Rifleman Privates P. P. Krisin, N. P. Kianov, holders of the Order of Glory of the, the Three Degree, San Instructor, Guards Sergeant I. Antipin, Commander of a Squad of Riflemen, Guards Junior Sergeant N. E. Polgov. During the offensive battles, the regiment was partially replenished with personnel at the expense of conscripts sent to the active units by field district military commissions. In the early days of December, we learned from the newspapers about the conference held in Tehran, the leaders of the three Allied powers, the Soviet Union, the United States and Great Britain, Stalin, F.D. Roosevelt and W. Churchill. I remember, came to me in the dugout, Ivan Efimovich Poltorak, and asked, Have you read, Yuri Andreevich, the Declaration of the Three Powers? I have, I answered. But I still didn't understand. 
Will the second front be opened or not? Yes, the wording is vague. We have come to a complete agreement on the scope and timing of operations to be undertaken from the east, west and south. Polterak read these lines from the declaration. But I guess you can't say it any other way. I personally think that in the 44th year, the second front will finally be opened. And where will the Allies go? I agreed. Otherwise we alone will enter Europe. It's coming to that. We of course did not know then, and could not know that Stalin, Roosevelt and Churchill signed on December 1st a secret military decision of the Tehran Conference. This document, it turns out, explicitly stated that Operation Overlord will be undertaken during May 1944, together with an operation against southern France. On the day the newspapers with the Tehran Conference documents arrived, political information was held in all units of the regiment. The agitators were instructed by the deputy politician and myself, the secretary of the party bureau and the regimental agitator. The persistence and fierceness of the battle for Alexandria and Zanamenka is evidenced by the fact that this operation lasted 20 days. Alexandria was liberated on December 6 and Znamenka on December 9. And although our division did not take part in the battles directly in these important strongholds of the enemy, we were rightfully considered liberators of these Ukrainian cities. On December 7th, for example, the regiment had to fight on the outskirts of Znamenka with counter-attacking enemy tank units. And we almost got into an encirclement at the Dikovka Passage, but thanks to the endurance and fortitude of the guardsmen the Germans did not manage to close the tank pincers. Together with us in a difficult situation were the other regiments of our division. We were rescued by the fighter anti-tank brigade and Katyusha units, which with a powerful fire blocked the way of enemy tanks. The machine gunners of the platoon commanded by Guards Lieutenant A. P. Shashakin showed military skill and fortitude. The squad consisting of Guards Junior Sergeant I. I. Erkin and Guards Private V. Y. Safronov acted exceptionally cool-bloodedly. Having let the attacking Hitlerites at a close distance, he opened an accurate fire and forced them to lie down. Both brave soldiers were awarded the Order of Glory of Thray Degree and their platoon commander received the Order of Red Star. I remember the defensive battle near the village Molodetskoy on December 10th. It was not easy for us then. The enemy forces of three battalions supported by six tanks and three self-propelled guns attacked the positions of the regiment. The main blow he struck at the junction of the battalions of the first echelon trying to cut them off from each other. But he did not succeed in cutting into the fighting order. The soldiers did not waver, showed fortitude and endurance, and the attack was repulsed. In this battle were seriously wounded battalion commander, guards Captain Black and company commander, guards senior Lieutenant Sokolov. They were carried from the battlefield by the sanitary instructor of the guards senior sergeant L.I. Malchuzhenko. Risking her life, she rendered medical aid to 11 more soldiers. Order of Glory of Three Degree was awarded to the brave girl Komsomol. More than 10 officers of the regiment were awarded for the December battles with the Order of Patriotic War of the I Degree. Among them, Guards Captain V.N. Efimov, Guards Captain N.N. Berezovoy, Guards Senior Lieutenant A.M. Kotlin. After the completion of the Alexandria's Namenskaya operation, the 5th Guards Army went on the defence and began to prepare for new battles. The respite was used not only for replenishment of personnel and military equipment, combat training, but also for generalisation of experience. In particular, these days was summarised experience of the Komsomol organisation of the regiment in the offensive battle. Komsorg of the regiment, Guards Lieutenant S. Gorin, gathered Komsorg of all units and told them about the work in the offensive Komsomol activists of the 1st Rifle Battalion. Three main tasks were solved by the battalion Komsomol organisation. Bringing the combat order to each soldier and personal example in the unconditional execution of this order, holding talks about automatic weapons and its use in battle, collecting and carrying out of the battlefield, 
weapons of the wounded and killed. Before the offensive in the companies were held Komsomol meetings with the agenda, we will fulfil the combat task. Agitators, Karpov, Konyaev, Abakumov and others talked to the soldiers, cheered them up, gave them confidence in our forces. During the attack, breaking through the enemy's defences and pursuing him, Komsomol activists were in the front ranks, dragging the rest behind them. Handwritten leaflets were written about the exploits of Komsomol members Prudayev, Malofeev and Karpov. These leaflets were passed along the chain. In January 1944, the division took part in the Kirovograd operation. The beginning of the offensive on Kirovograd, a major industrial centre of Ukraine, was planned for the morning of January 5th. The day of January 4th, the division commander gave regimental commanders to work out the issues of interaction in the Link Company battalion with staff and attached artillery and tank units with neighbours. With the commanders of battalions and companies of the first echelon, I clarified on the ground directions and objects of attack. And the next day, like other parts of the division, we resumed the offensive. Almost an hour lasted artillery preparation. It was so powerful and overwhelming for the enemy that when our troops attacked his front line, he was unable to provide organised resistance. Later, I was introduced to the testimony of a captured Oberleutnant of the 7th Company of the 20th Motorised Regiment. The Russians opened such a hurricane fire that no one could look out of the trench. Communication was broken. Communication between the front line and the rear was cut off. When the artillery fire was transferred to the depth of the defence, Russian infantry appeared in front of our trenches. Our losses were very great. 50% of the company's personnel were killed. This Oberleutnant spoke the truth. The 32nd Infantry Corps, in cooperation with the 7th Mechanized Corps, broke through the enemy defences and advanced 24 kilometres during the day. By the end of the day, both corps reached the Ingle River and began to bypass Kirovograd from the northwest. And in the morning of January 6th, the enemy, seeking to delay the advance of the Soviet troops, launched a counterattack on the right flank of the corps. About the strength of this blow can be judged at least by the fact that about a hundred tanks and assault guns went to our 97th Guards Division. I received orders to repel the tank attack of the enemy. It is clear that in one night we were not able to create a more or less solid defence. The soldiers of the 1st and 2nd Battalions entrenched on the heights, sappers managed to put mine barriers, but not densely. I kept the 3rd Battalion in the 2nd Echelon and with dawn on the heights crawled twenty German armoured cars with a troop of machine gunners. On the white snow, not yet smoked from the battle, Tigers and Ferdinands were clearly visible. This made the work of artillerymen easier. Gunners clearly fixed the targets in their sights. We must pay tribute to the artillerymen of the Regimental Anti-Tank Battery and Fighter Anti-Tank Division attached to us. Letting tanks and self-propelled vehicles at a range of direct fire, they managed to hit more than a dozen enemy vehicles before they approached the height. Several self-propelled vehicles were blown up on mines. Our machine gunners and riflemen who had dismounted were pinned to the ground. But five German tanks still broke through the fighting order of the first echelon and moved to the positions of artillerymen. From the regiment NP, I could clearly see how skillfully the gun crews acted. The gun crew of Guards Staff Sergeant I. Bezderozny, using only eight shells, hit two Tigers. The rest turned and went to the gun, which was commanded by Guard Staff Sergeant F. Shugailov. It was easier for him to hit the armoured vehicles as they put the sides under fire. One of them was hit by the first shot. The leading roller of the Tiger flew off and he fidgeted on the spot. Another tank was also set on fire by the first shell, and the crew of the fifth tank, apparently, decided not to test fate and at high speed tried to rush back behind the front edge, and there he exploded on a mine. I can't help but mention the mortarmen of the platoon of Guards Lieutenant G.P. Shakin. They helped the riflemen in repulsing the attack of enemy machine gunners. The platoon commander was awarded the Order of the Red Star for this battle, and Mortar Guards Sergeant I.P. Netrebo, 
Guard Sergeants V. S. Shvoev, P. E. Kapustin, A. V. Akinshin and P. F. Redkin, the Order of Glory, the 30 degree. January 7th, fighting unfolded on the outskirts of Kirovograd. The enemy clearly represented the importance of this regional centre of Ukraine as an important stronghold. Therefore, for its defence, he concentrated large forces of infantry and tanks. Here again we had to repel their desperate counter-attacks. The artillery men of the regimental battery of 76mm guns of Guard Senior Lieutenant A. M. Kotlin distinguished themselves. In the city itself, which was completely liberated on the night of January 8th, the soldiers of the regiment mainly acted as part of a tank landing. I will not enumerate the soldiers who distinguished themselves in this landing. I will name only the surnames of two machine gunners, two Alexanders, guards privates, Vinogradov and Jezeri. It was in Kirovograd that their fame was born as one of the most courageous fighters not only of our regiment but of the whole division. On January 8th, Moscow saluted with 20 artillery salvos from 224 guns in honour of the soldiers who liberated Kirovograd. On the same day, by the decree of the Presidium of the Supreme Soviet of the USSR, our division was awarded the Second Order of Suvorov the Second Degree, for excellent performance of the command's task in the Kirovograd operation. And now it was called the 97th Guards Poltava Red Banner, Poltava Rifle Division, Order of Suvorov. After the liberation of Kirovograd began fighting to destroy the encircled northwest of the city, parts of the 10th Motorized, 11th, 14th Tank, and 376th Infantry Divisions of the enemy but it was not possible to finish them off completely in the cauldron. Part of the enemy troops broke out of the encirclement. The fascist command did not want to accept the loss of Kirovograd and made attempts to return it. It pulled up the SS Great Germany Tank Division and surviving infantry units to the area. For several days the enemy counter-attacked the divisions of our corps. Especially hard fighting had to conduct the regiment on January 10th and 11th. Remembering the heroes of these battles, it is impossible not to mention the commanders of rifle companies. Guards Senior Lieutenant M. G. Dubina, Guards Lieutenants M. S. Sidorov and S. P. Chesnikov, Guards Lieutenants. P. Chesnikov, Guards Junior. Lieutenant V. I. Pavlov, Commander of the Machine Gun Company, Guards Senior Lieutenant V. N. Diki, Commander of the Platoon. N. Dickey, commander of the supply platoon. Guards Lieutenant A. D. Sklerenko, assistant platoon commander. Guards Sergeant N. P. Maslov and others awarded the Order of the Red Star. It is impossible not to pay tribute to the courage and fearlessness of machine gunners. Guards Private N. P. Bragin, A. M. Gorbin, machine gunners. Guards Private V. I. Pokila, D. Olimbaev and many others also awarded the Order of the Red Star. The artillerymen of the regiment, especially the soldiers of the 76 Mimitara battery, distinguished themselves in the battles for Kirovograd. They destroyed 16 enemy tanks and 11 armoured personnel carriers. Kirovograd operation was of great importance, having created favourable conditions for encirclement and defeat in the area of Korsun Shevchenkovskoye of a large group of fascist troops and the organisation of an offensive to enter northern Moldavia to the state border with Romania. January 8th, 289th, Guards Rifle Regiment 1st and 2nd Rifle Battalions took a new defensive line in the area of height 160.4, which is west of Kandaurovka and became the combat reserve of the 5th Guards Army and the 3rd Rifle Battalion was withdrawn to the formation and was about 30 kilometres from the location of the regiment. I already knew that to the post of commander of this battalion, instead of the departed to another part of the Guards Major, Balk Vadzi was appointed Captain Ari I. Belikov. Belikov. As I remember now, an officer of medium height, trim, black-haired, open-faced, appeared in the headquarters and reported, Comrade Guards Major, Captain Belikov arrived at your disposal as commander of the 3rd Rifle Battalion. 
In the headquarters dugout, we were two, and it was disposed to a frank conversation. I inquired about his service before coming to the regiment, learned that he fought, was wounded, treated in the hospital, and came to us from the reserve of the front command staff. When I asked him whether he had ever formed a battalion, Belikov answered in the affirmative. Well, then I have no instructions for now, I told him. Act according to the situation. I characterised the new commander, three his deputies. Adjutant Senior Guards, Senior Lieutenant Vien Igorov, was known to me as an energetic officer, exceptionally careful in performing his duties. The battalion's deputy commander in charge of formation, Guards Senior Lieutenant A. P. Malyshev, also had good commanding qualities. Indispensable assistant in all matters was the deputy battalion commander in the political part of the Guard Senior Lieutenant M. S. Chernichenko. He quickly got along with the soldiers and commanders, thanks to his calm, balanced character, natural wit and cheerful disposition. Everyone appreciated him for the fact that he was able to maintain high morale among the soldiers in a difficult front situation, never got discouraged and instilled confidence in victory in any difficult combat situation. I named the new commander and the commander of the battalion sanitary platoon, Guards Lieutenant Medical Service V.M. Sarafanov. He was one of the most experienced medics in the regiment. Captain Belikov got by inheritance and resident, Guards Privet N. Krupa, a small stature, perky, smart, with an excellent memory fighter, a model of a Russian soldier. He always understood his commander with half a word, was accurate, efficient, hard-working. In the headquarters, Dugout entered the commander of the economic platoon of the 3rd Battalion, Guards Petty Officer the Thur S. Kovalev, and, having asked permission to turn, gave me some documents to sign. It was about time you showed up, petty officer, I said to Kovalev. Here's your new master, I pointed to Belikov. Take him to the battalion. On January 15th, the regiment handed over its defence area to the 950th and 958th Rifle Regiments of the 299th Rifle Division and went to the northeastern outskirts of Gruskoye, where it took new positions and began to prepare for the next offensive operations. A week later, on January 22nd, the regiment was ordered to seize the village of Andreevka. I decided to put a troop of machine gunners on the five tanks attached to us. The commander of the assault rifle company, Guards Lieutenant Kalachev, commanded the landing. The Germans were taken by surprise. Therefore, the enemy defence was broken through on the move. Thirty checkers crushed three German guns, and their calculations were destroyed by our machine gunners. In the battle for Andreevka Guards Senior Sergeant Uglov, Guards Sergeant Botenko, Guards Privates. Jabarov, Berezkin, Kashpomenko, Chechvintsev, Krivtsov and others distinguished themselves in the tank landing. Following the paratroopers entered the village and other units of the regiment. I want to note the courage and bravery shown by the communists. During the battle over 20 dive bombers began to bomb our positions, the commander of the platoon of armoured gunners, Guards Junior Lieutenant Viktor Alexeyevich Merzlyakov, ordered the armoured gunners to open fire on the planes. I saw how one of them did not come out of the dive and crashed to the ground. Immediately there was a strong explosion. Then I was reported that the plane was shot down by a communist senior sergeant, A. Shakovnin. He put an anti-tank gun on the shoulder of the second number of guards Private Ostapenko, and hit the gas tank with the second shot. The plane caught fire in the air. The commander of the 4th Rifle Company, Guards Senior Lieutenant A. I. Korolkov, fought heroically in the same battle. The men of his company had to rush into hand-to-hand -hand combat to repel a German counterattack. Korolkov was wounded, but continued to command the company. Machine gunner N. L. Dmitriev fought valiantly. With his hand machine gun, he was in the front ranks of the attackers, almost at point-blank range shooting the Germans. He was the first to break into the enemy trenches and killed up to a dozen fascists with machine gun fire. In the midst of battle, the commander of the squad was wounded and Dmitriev took command. 
The Order of Glory of the Three Degree was awarded for the January battles to the commander of the mortar unit, young communist, recently accepted as a member of the All-Union Communist Party, Guards Senior Sergeant Vladimir Afanasyev. His calculation destroyed several enemy firing points, and all other communists justified their membership in the Bolshevik Party by deeds. I have already mentioned that in early January, machine gunner of the platoon of infantry reconnaissance Alexander Vinogradov by order of the division. Commander was awarded the Order of Glory, 3Y degree. On the night of February 1st, Guard Staff Sergeant Vinogradov volunteered to go on reconnaissance to take the tongue. He captured an Ober Efrayato and brought him to our front line. The scouts who went with him in the night search told how bravely and skillfully Vinogradov acted. The Chief of Intelligence of the regiment presented him for awarding the Order of Glory, second degree. I agreed with this and signed the award sheet. Then the same brave warrior was accepted as a candidate for party membership. He was given the rank of Guards Petty Officer and was appointed commander of a platoon of infantry reconnaissance. I will not be mistaken if I name among the most respected people of the regiment the commander of the sapper section, Guards Sergeant Peter Pavlovich Sanfirov. This already not young man was an unusually collected, exceptionally efficient soldier. It was said in the regiment that he was destined to become a sapper. On the night before the Battle of Andreevka Guards, Sergeant N. P. Sanfirov, together with guards, Private R. S. Gulyaev, under heavy machine gun and machine gun fire of the enemy, crawled up to the enemy minefield and disarmed eleven mines. Thanks to this, our reconnaissance went unhindered into the fighting order of the Germans and captured a German sniper. The assistant platoon commander of the Company of Automatic Riflemen, Guards Petty Officer G. I. Shchukin, distinguished himself in that battle. He led the support group during the capture of the control prisoner. And when the Germans discovered the capture group, the Petty Officer was the first to break into the enemy trench, destroyed several Hitlerites in hand-to-hand -hand combat, which diverted the attention and helped the scouts to fulfil the combat task. Until the end of January 1944, the 209th Guards Rifle Regiment did not carry out active offensive actions and was mainly engaged in improving its defensive lines. An important event in those days was the Regimental Conference of Junior Commanders. Former battle-scarred sergeants shared their combat experience with young commanders of departments and calculations. Extremely important at the front was a well-organised party political work. Its main method were conversations with each soldier or with small groups of soldiers and sergeants. Special attention was paid to those soldiers who had recently arrived in the regiment, untrained recruits. Political workers, party and komsomol activists of the regiment were often in companies, batteries, platoons, on the spot, instructing the grassroots activity. Company Comsorg, platoon activists, editors of combat leaflets. The deputy commander and I repeatedly set as an example in the organisation of political and mass work of the commander of the 1st Rifle Company, Guards Lieutenant M. S. Sidorov, the party commander of the company, Guards Petty Officer F. M. Altanin and Company Komsomorga, Guards Private Kamit Yusupov. The company commander skillfully relied on the party and Komsomol organisations, maintaining constant communication with the party and Komsomol members. He notified them of the upcoming battle, set tasks for political and educational work. So it was before the offensive on Andreevna, which I told earlier. Guards Lieutenant Sidorov invited the party commander recommended him to hold a meeting of party members of the company with the question, the tasks of the communists in the offensive battle. At the meeting, the company commander himself appealed to the communists to be an example of courage and fortitude. Two hours before the attack in the company held a brief rally under the slogan, where the guard is advancing, there the enemy will not resist. Speaking at the rally, Komsorg of the guards, Private Yusupov, spoke about the combat traditions of the company, about military duty to the motherland. And it should be said that the first rifle company successfully accomplished the combat tasks. 
In the same days, in our regiment was released the first issue of the handwritten magazine, dedicated to the participation of guardsmen in the battles for Kirovograd. The soul and inspirer of the author's team of the magazine was my deputy in the political part, Guards Major I. E. Polterak. A lot of materials were written by Guard Sergeant G. F. Skiba. He also designed the magazine artistically, describing the battle for the city, telling and showing the heroes of this battle, the authors did not only very important, but also very useful. The magazine passed from hand to hand, from trench to trench. It was read at the front line and at firing positions by sappers and farm workers. In the issue were placed portraits of distinguished in the battle's shooter Fomin, Scout Vinogradov, Mortarman Ustinov, Artilleryman Temnikov and Antoshkevich, Komsorg Afanasyev. There was also a brief description of the exploits of these comrades. The article is Before the Offensive, Kirovograd is ours, and Results of the Battles, told about party political work and special exercises before the offensive, about its progress and results. In the arsenal of means of party political work, there was also such a weapon as leaflets, congratulations, to the soldiers who distinguished themselves in battles. Such a leaflet was small in size, the format of a notebook sheet. At the top was the inscription, Heroes of Battles. Around the text was a frame. Congratulatory leaflets were reproduced and sent to the front line. Agitators held special talks on them. In my personal archive, there is a leaflet, Congratulations to the Guards Private Grigory Pereyaslov. Comrades, at height 220.7, the commander of the rifle gun crew, Guards Private Grigory Pereyaslov, showed courage and bravery in the battle with the German invaders. Eight tanks were moving on our fighting order. They were firing on the move. Comrade Pereyaslov, having let the head fascist car at 30 metres, hit it with an armour-piercing gun. The command of the guards presented Private Pereyaslov to the government award. Glory to you, hero armoured gunner Comrade Pereyaslov. Lead, and in the future, lead your comrades to the enemy. And in the 3rd Rifle Battalion, already fully formed, there were classes on combat training. Captain Belikov decided to hold a night tactical exercise, Battalion in Offensive Combat. He called me on the phone and informed me that he intended to conduct this exercise with live firing and the use of hand grenades. I did not object, only warned the commander to provide security measures. In the morning, Belikov reported that the exercise was successful. The companies acted in a friendly manner, interaction was good, no accidents occurred. And a short time later, there was a call from Major General I, I Ansiferov of the Guards. What was the shooting at night in the area of Gruski? he asked. The entire division headquarters became alarmed, and in the rear there was a commotion. They were waiting for the Germans to break through. It was Captain Belikov who conducted a night exercise with live firing, Comrade General. I gave him permission. That's what I thought. I heard our machine guns and automatic rifles hitting. Well, how was the lesson? Everything is in order, Comrade General. No emergencies. Good. Belikov is good. He's teaching the men what they need in war. That was the end of the conversation with the commander. A few days later, General Antsiferov organised a control inspection of the 3rd Battalion. I, of course, was together with the division commander, and I was pleased when, in front of the battalion, he announced to all the personnel a commendation for good combat training. Later, at a meeting at the division headquarters, General Ansiferov noted that of the three battalions being formed, the best was the battalion of the 289th Guards Rifle Regiment. Before the 26th anniversary of the Red Army, we all learned with joy about the successful completion of the Korsun Shevchenkovsk operation conducted by the troops of the 1st and 2nd Ukrainian fronts. Our division did not participate directly in this operation, but when the enemy began to remove the tank units of the 5th Guards Army and transfer them to the area of Korsun Shevchenkovskoye to unblock their troops, 
which had fallen into another cauldron, we received an order to bind the enemy forces by active offensive actions. On February 23rd, in the regiment held a rally on the occasion of the holiday. It was addressed by veterans of the regiment, participants of the battles of Rostov and Stalingrad, and young soldiers who had already distinguished themselves in the battles of Kursk Bulge and Right Bank, Ukraine. On this day, three girls arrived to our regiment, a delegation from the Komsomol and youth of Kirovograd region, headed by the head of the Department of Working Youth of the Regional Committee of the Komsomol Rudik. They brought more than 100 gifts for the guardsmen. The girls went to all units and personally handed gifts to the best Komsomol soldiers and young fighters. February 25th, 3rd. Rifle battalion arrived at the location of the regiment. The next day, the regiment lined up in a marching column on the southeastern outskirts of Bogodarivka and moved along the route of Sianikovo, Gruskoye, Oboznovka, Lelikovka. We marched through Ukrainian villages, hamlets and farms. I, a Ukrainian, did not have to be particularly surprised by their names. But the chief of staff of the regiment, Guards Major Vasily Vasilievich Takmovtsev could not hold back a smile when he checked the route of the regiment with the map. The village of Kvitki, farms Guy and Vesely, the village of Grusha, but these poetic names of settlements sharply contrasted with the devastation and desolation that reigned in them after the departure of the Nazis, and with those traces of atrocities that eloquently testified to the brutal appearance of the German looting army. We entered Kvitki when the ashes were still smoking. Almost all the houses had been burned. On one of the streets, the soldiers came across the burnt corpse of a Red Army soldier, and not far from him lay naked naked another soldier of ours, killed by a shot in the back of the head, and on the skin of his back there was a blackened five-pointed star. At the farm guy, also burned to the ground, only stovepipes were sticking out, we met an old man and an old woman dressed in rags, exhausted from hunger. A grey-haired old man with a floppy moustache looked at us attentively, squinting at his epaulets. My orderly handed him a pouch. Help yourself, father, to the guard's mahorka. The old man smiled gratefully, rolled a cigar with trembling fingers. The orderly took off his trophy cloak tent and handed it to Granny. Take it, Granny. It's protection from the wind. Thank you, my son. God bless you. The Vesely farm was wiped out. Only cherry trees stood burnt. Next on the way is the village of Grusha. It too was looted. No cows, no horses, no poultry. In the collective farmyard there is a charred hulk of a combine harvester. Women, old men and children, and there are only a dozen or three of them, came out of cellars and pits where they were hiding from the Nazis. On the night of March 7th, we took the initial position for the offensive from the area southwest of Kirovograd. And two days before that, the division commander, Guards Major General I. I. Antsiferov and the Chief of Staff, Guards Lieutenant Colonel Y. P. Bokov conducted with regimental commanders reconnaissance of the terrain and the location of the enemy in the offensive strip. Spring that year in Ukraine was early. Already at the end of January, the snow began to melt, even the rains came. The country roads had melted and became impassable. During the reconnaissance, which lasted for several hours, we all had a hard time pulling our boots out of the thick mud. Together with us was the head of the political department of the division, Guards Lieutenant Colonel S. A. Pantelayev. General Ansiferov pointed us to the positions of the 106th Infantry Division, which we were to break through. The Germans are sitting here for almost two months, he said, strengthened strongly. In front of their front line, they have solid anti-personnel and anti-tank minefields. Therefore, Comcor gave us a small front breakthrough, only two kilometres, 300 metres. 294th Regiment will act on the main direction and strip it about a kilometre, and on the front of 1,300 metres will attack the enemy 292nd Regiment. 299th Regiment is advancing in the second echelon. On the night of March 8th, our sappers, using the darkness, made passes in the minefields. 
Before dawn, the units allocated for this purpose conducted a reconnaissance by combat in order to identify the fire system of the Nazis, and at seven dawn a volley of Katyusha began artillery preparation. For fifty minutes our cannons, howitzers and heavy and rocket mortars chiselled and cracked the enemy's defence. We were to enter the battle after the 294th Guards Rifle Regiment broke through the first German position at height 220.7. At the signal of the commander, the regiment moved forward. The newly formed 3rd Rifle Battalion was in the lead. I firmly believed that Captain Belikov will be able to fulfil any combat task. And I was not mistaken in him. The battalion timely came to the attack line in front of Antonovka, and then it was counter-attacked by eight German tanks. From the NP of the regiment, taken to the height of 220.7, I could clearly see how skillfully the soldiers of the battalion repelled this counter-attack. Two calculations of anti-tank guns quickly deployed the guns, and, having let the enemy vehicles up to 400 metres, the first shots hit two of them. The tanks changed course, putting the sides under fire, and two more tanks were damaged by artillery men. True, after that the guns were silent. As it turned out later, the calculations were destroyed by the Germans. I saw the fifth tank catch fire. Then we found out that it was hit with an anti-tank gun by an armoured gunner, Guards Private Pereyaslov. He got a bullet in the gas tank. The sixth tank came almost close to the position occupied by the gunners. And then three soldiers with anti-tank grenades in their hands jumped out of the trench and crawled to the tank. They almost simultaneously threw grenades on its stern and it rumbled and then began to burn. Later I was told that these three men were Guards Sergeant Lebedev and Guards Privates Volkozov and Shchetinin from the 7th Company of Guards Lieutenant Slesarev. The two remaining German tanks crawled away into the village. When the 1st and 2nd battalions pulled up, I ordered to take Antonovka, and by the end of the day it was cleared of the enemy, and the next day in the battle for the village of Shevchenko again distinguished the 3rd Rifle Battalion, the first to break in there on the shoulders of the retreating Germans. But they managed to organise the defence and gave our fighters strong resistance. It took several hours to overcome it and take possession of the village. But the battalion commander, Captain Belikov, was not lucky. He came under fire of the enemy machine gun and was seriously wounded. He had to be sent to the medical centre. That's how it happened at the front. Only two days a man fought, so eager to fight, and was out of action. When I was informed about it, I was very worried. I had already recognised Belikov as a smart and brave officer. And then a new report. Guards Lieutenant Slesarev, whom I had shaken hands with only yesterday and thanked for his skilful actions in repelling a tank counterattack near Antonovka, was killed. I was at his funeral. I thought sadly, how many comrades in arms had to be buried, and how many more will have to be buried? And though I looked closely and got used to death at the front for two and a half years, each one hurt my heart. At the brief funeral meeting, one of the best machine gunners of the regiment, Alexander Zhezheria, spoke and spoke very warmly about his dead company commander. Then he approached Guards Lieutenant Korobko, who had just been appointed part Torgon Battalion, and silently handed him a piece of paper. This is my application with a request to be accepted into the party. I was reported to me about the feat of a soldier Filip Otretsev in the battle for the village of Shevchenko. It so happened that during the hand-to-hand -hand fight he was surrounded by five Hitlerites. It would seem that the fighter died. But not so. Otretsev shot one of them, killed two of them with a bayonet, stunned the fourth one with a buttstock, and tore off the fifth one's helmet and hit him so hard on the head that he fell down dead. Our soldier's overcoat was pierced in four places by bullets, but he himself was not hit by a single bullet. His comrades joked after this battle. Our Philip is immortal. Bullets don't take him. I ordered the commander to present Guards Private Otretsev to the Order of Glory of the 13th Degree. After this battle, I also signed the award list for Guards Private Ya. S. Lopata, who destroyed the calculation of enemy machine gun, preventing the advance of our fighters, on Guards Private Eye. 
T. Vintovkin, fire from the captured by him German machine gun put more than a dozen Hitlerites and on our other fighters. Ahead was the district centre of Novo Ukranica. It was to be taken by storm by our division in cooperation with the 13th Guards Rifle Division, but it was still necessary to reach Novo Ukranka, and the spring mud, as well as last fall, was impenetrable. Even on horseback it was difficult to move. Almost every kilometre we had to stop to give the horse a rest. The troops were assisted by the population of the liberated areas. Old men, women, teenagers. They at least somehow tried to tidy up the roads, built bridges. During those days I saw local people carrying boxes with shells and mines, tanks with ammunition on carts pulled by cows or on drags, or even carrying ammunition on their hands. Older men helped to pull guns and cars out of the mud. Women took care of the wounded. The 97th Guards Rifle Division closed the left flank of the 32nd Guards Corps and the entire 5th Guards, and our 289th Guards Regiment was on the left flank of the division. The neighbour on the left was already a regiment from the division, part of another army. And of course it was important for the command of the division and corps that when storming Novo Ukrenka, the regiment would be ahead of the neighbour on the left and the first to break into the city. Of course, there was not and could not be an official competition in frontline conditions. There reigned His Majesty, the combat order. But there was a healthy rivalry between brothers in arms. Who would be the first to go up to the attack? Who would be the first to knock the enemy out of the heights? Who would be the first to break into the city? And it was even encouraged by commanders of all ranks, from sergeant to marshal, because it served one great and noble goal, the defeat of the enemy victory. And the division commander, giving us regimental commanders, the task to capture Novo Ukrainka, especially warned me that the regiment did not lag behind the neighbour on the left. And the first to enter the city, honour and praise to you, concluded Ivan Ivanovich and Siferov. On March 15th, we took the initial positions about 10 kilometres from Novo Ukrainka. I was at the CP, in a damp, narrow dugout, looking more like a front trench, slightly covered with a wooden deck on top. Every now and then I looked at the telephone set, included in the line of the division commander. I knew that the order to attack the city was about to come. Time dragged slowly. The ceiling was dripping, the damp wind was blowing in the entrance to the dugout covered with a cloak tent. At last, the buzzer of the telephone beeped. Rainbow was calling Tulip. I picked up the phone in full confidence that it would be General Ant Sifarov speaking to me, and suddenly a distantly familiar, slightly hoarse voice. Zhadov speaking. I was a little taken aback, but immediately pulled myself together. The third listener, Comrade Commander, I wish you good health. Hello? Did you get the task from the first? Is it clear? Yes, the task is clear. Will you break into the city first, Naumenko? I'm counting on you. I will, Comrade Commander. Good. That was the end of the conversation. With our commander, Lieutenant General A.S. Zhadov. I first met in April 1943, after the Battle of Stalingrad. At that time, the regiment was engaged in combat training, and the commander with a group of officers came to see how things were going with us. I remember that Alexei Semyonovich walked leaning on a stick, the consequences of a leg wound. I saw him a few more times, and now this conversation. Well, good guys, I said to Polterak and Takmovtsev, who were sitting in the dugout on the bunk, we must enter the city first, otherwise we'll lose the commander's confidence. Ivan Yefimovich, I turned to my deputy politician, Explain the task to the political workers, let them talk to the soldiers, and I'll quickly gather the commanders. Together with Guards Major Polterak in the units went to the regiment's party leader, Guards Captain G. I. Borozanets, Regiment Agitator, Guards Captain I. I. Starostenko, Commander of the Regiment. I. Starostenko, Komsorg of the Regiment, Guards Captain E. A. Kirev. 
On the night of March 17th, the regiment, pursuing the enemy, came to Novo Ukrainka and took refuge in ravines and gullies near the northeastern outskirts. We knew that the approaches to the town were mined, so I ordered the sappers to make passages in the minefields. This was done in the evening, under cover of darkness. At 24 Euseros, the regiment began the attack. With artillery in the fighting order, the guards approached the passages in the minefields to the city itself, and there occasionally flares flashed, picking out of the darkness bizarre outlines of houses and buildings of the railroad station. The Germans must have been nervous. It was so dark that it was difficult to guess the figures of battle comrades walking side by side in three steps. In front, following the sappers moved scouts, led by Assistant Chief of Staff for Intelligence Guards Senior Lieutenant at Zolotov. On my order, all officers went along with the fighters. In the ranks of the advancing were and I and all my deputies. The first to penetrate the city was the company of guards, Lieutenant Korolev. At one o'clock in the morning, it rushed into the northeastern outskirts and seized the railroad station, causing quite a stir in the camp of the enemy. This was taken advantage of by other units and parts of our division and began to advance through the streets of the city. They were supported by the 16th Mechanized Brigade of the 7th Mechanized Corps. The fascists at first desperately resisted then turned to flight, abandoning dozens of vehicles, many warehouses with military equipment. By the morning of March 17th, Novo Ukrenka was cleared of the enemy. Since the regiment had difficulty with transportation, I decided to put in order five trophy trucks and load them with ammunition for delivery to the regiment. I called the Chief of Artillery Armament, Guards Senior Lieutenant Kudenko. That's what, Nikolai Mikhailovich, I told him. Leave as many masters as necessary, choose the Kraut Rovers, which are better preserved, put them in line, load them with ammunition and catch up with the regiment. I'll assign you a squad of machine gunners to guard and help the foreman. Yes, Comrade Major, Kodenko called out. I think I'll catch up with the regiment in three days. Well, that's good. And indeed, by the end of the third day, a column of five trucks arrived at the location of the regiment, and Nikolai Mikhailovich reported to me about the completion of the task. By the way, three of the five German all-terrain vehicles served us well until the end of the war. On the night preceding the storming of Novo Ukraika, in the village of Ulyanivka, the party commission at the political department of the division approved the decision of the regiment's party organisation to accept Alexander Efimovich Zhezheri, as a candidate for membership in the All-Ukrainian Communist Party. He was presented to the party commission by the regiment's part Torgist, Guards Captain Borozanets. He reported that the machine gunner was recommended by the battalion commander, Guards Captain Alexei Kuzmich Steblevsky, his deputy commander, Guards Senior Lieutenant Boris Petrovich Pavlov, and the battalion part Torg. Guards Lieutenant Arseny Nikolevich Korobko that Jejeri had distinguished himself in more than one battle. Do not allow the enemy to gain a foothold on the intermediate lines. With such a task, 209th Guards Rifle Regiment, which, among others, was saluted by Moscow for the liberation of Novo Ukrenka in the evening of March 17, 1944, again went on a campaign. Perhaps, during the whole war, I have never seen so much abandoned fascist equipment on the roads, as in the right bank, Ukraine, in this spring. Tigers and panthers in the ditches and on the roadsides, or even directly on the road, sluggishly lowered the barrels of the guns, and the guns stuck together with tractors had their barrels sticking up, as if cursing the sky, which spewed so much water. And all this black burned, because Hitler's soldiers poured gasoline on the equipment and set it on fire, so that our advancing units would not get it. Sometimes on the roads there were formidable debris from the armament and equipment abandoned by the Germans, and we had to pull up this scrap metal to free the roadway for our vehicles, tanks and artillery. It was simply impossible to fight to destroy the retreating enemy using the usual methods. Therefore, on the recommendation of Commander General Zhadov, the regiments began to create mobile groups reinforced with tanks, machine guns and mortars. The actions of these groups could be supported by artillery only on horse traction,
because the tractors were stuck in the mud. Our division commander decided to transfer some of the cannon batteries of the Divisional Artillery Regiment to horse traction, and they accompanied the mobile groups. In our regiment skillfully operated such groups, combined in a detachment under the command of the battalion commander, Guards Capt. K. Stablevsky. On the right bank of the Southern Bug, the enemy created a strong defensive line. In addition, the German command pinned great hopes on the Pervomysky fortified area. The town of Pervomysk, the district centre of the Nikolaev region, located in the Ben of the Southern Bug and near the confluence of the river Sinyuka, was protected from the east by two water frontiers. On March 20, the regiment forced the Sinyuka, the bridges over which were blown up by the Germans. Its width is small, only a few tens of metres. The sappers, under the direction of the regimental engineer, Guard Senior Lieutenant M. M. Kachaturov, quickly built a crossing from barrels and planks. All the horses were allowed to swim. Pervomysky fortification turned out to be a hard nut to crack. For two days, March 21st and 22, day and night, both corps of our 5th Guards Army stormed it. As always before serious trials, the influx of applications for admission to the party increased. Before the forcing of the Southern Bug, 12 such applications were submitted. Here is what was, for example, written by the commander of the machine gun platoon, Guards Lieutenant Ivanov. I am a participant of the battles of 1943, forced the Dnieper, was twice wounded. I swear that the high rank of a member of the Leninist party I will justify with honour in the battles on the right bank of the Southern Bug and in all subsequent ones, as long as I am alive. And it must be said that he justified the trust of the party. He fought bravely and skilfully. On March 22nd, our division, as well as all the compounds of the 5th Guards Army, went to the bank of the Southern Bug. The weather was, frankly speaking, lousy, snow with rain, gusty, penetrating wind. There were waves with white lambs on the river. And in such weather we forced it, in fact, from the start. We used improvised means. Our sapper units had fallen behind because of the thaw. The first to cross the river were the machine gunners under the command of Guards Senior Lieutenant K.D. Koryachko. In the village of Pokutino, on the right bank of the river, they captured the three outermost houses and secured themselves. When I was reported about it, I gave the command to cross the battalions. I crossed by boat together with the commander of the second rifle battalion, and on the left bank I left my deputy captain Chirva with the task to manage the crossing of rear units and regimental artillery. By noon the regiment captured a bridgehead over a kilometre wide and the same amount of approximately in depth. All day long the enemy made desperate counter-attacks, trying to recapture the bridgehead captured by us and throw us into the river. A critical situation was created on the site of the 2nd Rifle Battalion near the suburban village of Tokarevka. Guards Captain Stablevsky sent a contact to me with a request for help, and I saw myself. NP was only 100 metres from our front line, that Hitlerites were advancing and were about to crush our fighters. What to do? I had about three dozen machine gunners in reserve. I ordered to take out and unfurl the battle guard's banner of the regiment. The flag bearer of the guard sergeant Grigory Dobroskokin, accompanied by two assistants, appeared at the NP. Here also came up and machine gunners. That's what, guys, I say to all of them. The second battalion is unlikely to hold if we do not help them. Banner forward, guardsmen, follow me. And we ran to the front line and the Germans had already come close to the hastily dug trenches of the 2nd Battalion. We had to enter the battle from the start. The enemy attack was repulsed that day. And in the scarlet cloth of the battle banner there were bullet holes. When I came back to the post, Guard Senior Lieutenant Zolotov reported that the division commander had called and ordered me to contact him. Immediately the telephonist connected me with General Ansiferov, I recognised his bassy, slightly hoarse voice immediately. I praise you for bringing the guard's banner to the battlefield. It inspired the soldiers in a difficult moment. But I scold you for going to the front line yourself. 
You're the regiment commander and you have no right to put your head under enemy fire. I'm reprimanding you. Yes, a reprimand, comrade first, I responded, satisfied that the general spoke to me generally kindly. Of course, I myself realised that I had acted rashly, but there are times in battle when emotions, rather than reason and calculation, take over. I gave in to these emotions and rushed with the machine gunners to the front line. It should be taken into account that I had just turned 25, two weeks ago. If I had been older, maybe I would have acted differently. In the battles on the bridge Ahid heroically fought machine gunners of guard Senior Lieutenant Koryachko, soldiers of the 4th Rifle Company, of Guards Lieutenant Schwarzev, 1st Rifle Company of Guards Senior Lieutenant Popov, again distinguished machine gun crew of Alexander Zhezheri. Together with his assistants, guards privates, Yati Fedorov, G. I. Sivak and V. A. Lunev, he was among the first to force the southern bug, and in the battles near Tokarevka, their maxim almost never cooled down. On the account of the calculation, two machine gun points of the enemy and several dozens of Hitlerites. To the order of glory of the three degree were presented to the rifleman guards privates A. V. Ivanov and A. D. Polishchuk, who in hand to hand combat with the enemy killed several enemy soldiers. At Tokarevka village, the commander of the anti tank gun, Guards Senior Sergeant Fyodor Markovich Yurchenko performed a feat. This staid, a little phlegmatic Poltava man, who was already under 30, was transformed in battle. On March 22nd, the whole calculation of his gun was taken out of service. Yurchenko was left alone, acting for the gunner and for the loader and for the carrier. He destroyed two machine guns, a cart with ammunition, dozens of Hitlerites. For this feat, Fyodor Markovich was awarded the Order of Glory of the Thirty Degree. For three days we fought on the right bank of the Southern Bug together with other parts of the division and corps that crossed after us. On March 26, the Germans, unable to withstand the blows of our troops, began to withdraw to the Dniester, leaving vehicles, tanks, guns, tractors, armoured personnel carriers because of lack of fuel and mud. And if not for this impenetrable mud, everything would have been fine. The Germans, in fact, ran away from us, not even shooting back. It was impossible to catch up with them, to get closer, as they say, to a rifle shot. The soldiers were literally falling down from fatigue. After all, we had to carry the equipment with us. It was good that ammunition for small arms, ATGMs and grenades were delivered to us by PO2 airplanes. The sun rarely peeped through, the days are cloudy. When the regiment crossed a small river Kodima and we stopped for a rest, we heard loud explosions in Lyubashevka, the district centre of Odessa region. Near the regiment's marching headquarters there was a company of machine gunners. I can hear a short, blue-eyed nursing instructor, Sonia Dmitrieva, who arrived from the hospital a few days ago, saying to the soldiers surrounding her, Soldiers, dear ones, listen to these explosions. It's fascist bastards tearing the body of our native land. The machine gunners already knew that Sonia was twice badly wounded, that she was awarded two medals for bravery. Nothing, Sonia. They have not long left to dominate the Soviet land. The troops of our front have already reached the state border with Romania on the Prut River. Comforted, her guards, junior sergeant, Sasha Yazov, commander of a squad of machine gunners. I knew well this blond-haired boy who had recently been awarded the Order of Glory, third class, on behalf of the division commander. We caught up with the enemy only on April 9, or rather, not caught up, but approached the heights where he had managed to gain a foothold. At down the battle began. All approaches to the heights were shot through. Our artillerymen opened not frequent because of lack of ammunition, but accurate fire on the crest of the heights, overgrown with sparse curly oak with rare yellow people last year's leaves, destroying enemy firing points. Finally, under the cover of mortar fire of Guards Lieutenant G. Shakin and gun crews Marinik, Yurchenko Durihin soldiers with shouts of Hurrah! rose to the attack. The second company was led by the battalion commissar of the Guards Junior Lieutenant Z. A. Shinin, a slightly lanky, swarthy guy. He was the first to jump out on the berm, 
grabbed a pistol from his holster and ran forward, dragging the men behind him. But after a few steps, Shinin suddenly grabbed his chest and fell. We buried the brave Komsorg in the village Rossianivka near the school, under tall, shady trees. On a dressed plaque, nailed to a small post, wrote, Guards Junior Lieutenant, Shainin Z. A., 1923-1944. 9.1U. Glory to the hero who fell in the battles for our motherland. The mail arrived, three days behind. Adjutant of the Guards Lieutenant D. M. Litvinsky handed me a letter from the mother of Alexander Zhezheri, to whom the deputy police officer and I reported how bravely her son fights. There is no greater joy, she wrote, than to receive from you, comrades commanders, such a letter as I received. I have learned of my son's combat exploits. I give my son, Alexander Efimovich, this instruction. Study military equipment. Beat the fascists well and destroy them, scoundrels. Repay for the death of your brothers. Obey your commanders. With greetings, Zhezheria, Priska Ilkovna, Voroshilovka village, Alexandria district, Kirovograd region. I recognised Guards Major Polterak, read this letter to him and said, Maybe you'll go to the 7th Company, Ivan Yefimovich. Familiarise all the men with the letter, and Zhezhera will be happy. I thought about it myself, said the Deputy Commander. It is necessary to educate people on such letters. From Pervomysk through Lyubashevka, Ananiev, Zatishye, Frunzovka near Grigoriopol, we reached the Dniester on April 12th. I calculated on the map the way of the regiment from under Kirovograd to here. It turned out that we passed for 34 days about 380 kilometres, and it was in the spring thaw, almost without leaving the battle. During these days we all learned with joy that our troops liberated Odessa on April 10th, that successful battles were going on to clear Crimea from fascists. Our division had to cross the Dniester River on the night of April 13th in the area west of the village of Tashlik. I say to cross and not to force, because in this area on the western bank was the 95th Guards Rifle Division of our corps, which had forced the Dniester the day before. We crossed the bridgehead occupied by it on improvised means, boats, rafts, and the width of the river is about 200 metres with a depth of up to 6 metres, and the speed of the current is great. On the third day, all units of the regiment were on the right bank of the Dniester. For days without sleep worked at the crossing, ensuring uninterrupted delivery of ammunition and food, as well as evacuation of the wounded, the assistant chief of staff of the regiment on the home front, guards captain V.L. Gorodko, chief of artillery guards, senior lieutenant N.M. Kodenko, Commander of the Transport Company. Guards Senior Lieutenant I. F. Danilenko, Head of the Ammunition Depot. Guards Senior Sergeant P. I. Slatin and many others. For two days, the regiment as part of the division fought for the possession of Pugocini to expand the bridgehead. In these battles performed a feat of anti-tank gun commander, Guards Staff Sergeant F. M. Yurchenko. Moving in the infantry fighting order, his crew destroyed an anti-tank gun and a machine gun of the enemy with an accurate shot. Courage and heroism were shown by communicators of the guards Private Petrov and Smirnov. While restoring the communication line, which was broken in several places, they noticed that the Germans were running around one anti-tank gun, the calculation of which was also completely out of order. The liaison men killed three of them, wounded two and captured one. We were greatly annoyed by enemy aviation. From morning till evening, fascist attack planes U-87 bombed the troops' combat orders. Our fighters did not appear in the air for the first two days, as it was impossible to relocate aviation in time because of the thaw. And only on the third day we breathed easier. Red Star, Hawks and attack aircrafts appeared from behind the Dniester, and right before our eyes an air battle broke out in the air. I myself saw how one of our fighters shot down two enemy planes. Enveloped in flames, they fell very close to the regiment's CP. There even rushed a few men of the Commandant's platoon, in case the pilots were alive, 
we could take them prisoner. But of course, they found only burnt corpses. On April 16th, both Guards Rifle Corps of the 5th Guards Army went on the offensive from the bridgehead against three infantry divisions of the enemy in the direction of Chimisheni, Kobuska Veke. Our regiment was advancing in the first echelon of the division and received a breakthrough area about one and a half kilometres wide. Following the firing rampart, the soldiers of the 1st and 2nd Battalions, acting in the 1st echelon, went up in attack. First broke into the enemy trenches soldiers of the 1st Battalion of Captain M. F. Ananenko, and again distinguished themselves in this battle the calculation of anti-tank gun guards Staff Sergeant Fyodor Yurchenko. Another order of glory, Seklai degree sparkled on his uniform. The same order was awarded for this battle and the commander of the mortar crew, Guard Senior Sergeant Vladimir Afanasyev. His calculation bravely acted during the reflection of the counter-attack, destroying the enemy armoured personnel carrier and machine gun. On April 22nd, all units of the regiment held political informations dedicated to the 74th anniversary of Lenin's birth. I spoke before the regimental scouts and signallers. I reminded them of Lenin's precepts to reliably defend the conquests of socialism with weapons in their hands, to study military science in a real way, to strengthen discipline in every possible way, to be vigilant in everything. When I returned to the CP, Guards Major Takmovtsev reported to me that the order was received tomorrow, by 12 noon, to ensure that the regiment commander, deputy police officer, regimental agitator and several soldiers would be present at the division headquarters to receive awards. And you, comrade guards major, were asked to call the division commander, added Vasily Vasilievich. They didn't tell me why the commander needed me. I was worried. Negative, answered the chief staber, and I see himself smiling. My heart was relieved. I called General Antsiferov. Naumenko is reporting. I congratulate you, Yuri Andreevich. I hear in the phone, just informed me from the army headquarters. Signed an order to award you the rank of Lieutenant Colonel. Congratulations from the bottom of my heart. I, of course, thanked Ivan Ivanovich for such pleasant news, answered as I should. I serve the Soviet Union. And the Chief of Staff smiled slyly again and said, Congratulations and I, Yuri Andreevich and gives me a new field epaulets with two stars on each. And the next day we went to the division headquarters, and there, in a solemn atmosphere, we were presented with state awards. I received the order of Alexander Nevsky. This is for you, for Novo Ukrenka, Yuri Andreevich, said the commander, attaching the order to my jacket. Remember the words of Alexander Nevsky. Whoever comes to us with a sword will perish by the sword. Ivan Ivanovich was addressing all those present. So the Russian land stood stands and will stand on that. The general shook my hand and suddenly said, How, comrade Naumenko, will your guardsmen stand on the bridgehead? We will, comrade general, I assured the commander. Look, the enemy will counterattack with large forces. There is new data from our intelligence. We must hold out. E. I. Ant Sifarov presented the Order of the Red Star to Guards Major Polterak and Guards Captain Starostenko. Then the name of Guards Petty Officer Vinogradov was called. And when he came to the general with a clear formation step, he handed him the Order of Glory, Sekui degree, to which Alexander Fedotovich was presented in early February. The division commander embraced the scout and, shaking his hand, said, Well, Guardsman, I believe you will be a full cavalier of the Order of Glory. Well done, you fight skillfully. Congratulations again. I should note that in two weeks, Communist Vinogradov again distinguished himself in the battle on the Nesta bridgehead. In the night search, he crawled unnoticed to the enemy trench, threw grenades at it, killing five soldiers, and captured a non-commissioned officer who tried to escape. When I was reported about this, I decided to present him to the Order of Glory, first class. I expressed my opinion to the deputy police officer and the chief of staff. Both Polterak and Takmovtsev supported me. 
Medal for Combat Merits received from the hands of the General and the Cook of the Commandant Platoon of the Regiment, an elderly soldier whom everyone called Uncle Afonia. He managed to feed more than a dozen people during the day. His ladle was always generous, but Uncle Afonia was even more generous with a cheerful and witty word. Everyone knew about him, but they didn't know one thing. When does he sleep? And two days later, as the commander had warned, the Germans began their attack on the bridgehead. How hot were these battles? You can judge at least by the fact that the 1st Battalion repulsed 12 fierce attacks of the enemy and survived. During the 8th attack, a group of German machine gunners broke through to the battalion CP. Communication with the companies was interrupted. Combat guards Major Ananenko, having organised a circular defence, rushed with soldiers in hand-to-hand -hand combat. The survived Hitlerites retreated. The enemy introduced new reserves into the battle. Fascist diving planes howled over the heads of our soldiers. During the next bombing, Mikhail Fedorovich Ananenko died. His deputies were also out of action, and the battalion's part Torg, Guards Lieutenant Arsenti Korobko, took command. I felt the death of Mikhail Fedorovich, whom I had met during the Battle of Stalingrad in December 1942. He was an excellent commander and a good, warm-hearted man. Fighters and commanders loved him. In this heavy battle, Alexander Jejeri's calculation distinguished itself again. He chose a firing position under the knocked-down fascist tank, and from there he poured fire on the attacking Hitlerites. One of the numbers of the calculation, Guards Private Lunev, was wounded and sent to the rear. Alexander was wounded in the arm, but he quickly bandaged the wound and again lay down behind the machine gun. In the days of May, a leaflet with a portrait of A.E. Zagheri was distributed throughout the division. The engraving for the cliché was executed by the artist of the divisional newspaper Heroic Campaign, V. Belusov. The inscription reads, Hero gunner Alexander Zagheria, for two months of fighting destroyed 343 Hitlerites. He was wounded three times, but did not leave the battlefield. Immediately after the hard fighting on the Denista bridgehead at the end of April, the command of the regiment and division presented the Guard Sergeant Sergeant Alexander Zagheria to the highest award of the motherland, the title of Hero of the Soviet Union. Now it is to the place, in my opinion, to tell about Alexander Zegeria in more detail. He came to our regiment in 1944 with a marching company from the Reserve Regiment. He worked as a beekeeper before he was drafted. He was in charge of a collective farm apiary. At first he was an ordinary machine gunner, then he was entrusted with the calculation of Maxime. He was born from Kirovograd region and he received his baptism of fire on his native land in the battles for Kirovograd. His mother, Praskovia Ilinichina, whose letter, as the reader remembers, was read to the soldiers by Ivan Efimovich Poltorak, lived in the village of Alexandrovna with Alexander's wife Maria and their children, her grandchildren, Valentin and Lida. Two brothers of Alexander, Nikolai and Yakov, died at the front. One near Kishinev at the very beginning of the war, the other, in Stalingrad. The third brother, Vasily, after a heavy wound in Stalingrad, stayed there to rebuild the destroyed city. Alexander got to serve in the rifle company of Lieutenant V. Slesarev in the platoon of Guards Lieutenant Korobko. The first combat award, the Medal for Bravery, the junior sergeant received for the battle near Krasny Kut in February, when he was wounded but did not leave the battlefield. It became a rule in our regiment to send congratulatory letters to the families of distinguished soldiers on the eve of holidays. It is even difficult to count how many of them were sent during the war to different parts of our vast homeland. These letters were short, but it seems desired in any family. After all, news from the front is always joyful. So it was before May 1st, 1944. Here, for example... What letter was sent to the wife of the hero gunner, guards Private Matvienko? Dear Raisa Romanovna, the commander of the unit sends you, the wife of the brave machine gunner, 
his combat guards greetings and congratulates you on the great holiday. May 1st Day. Guards, Lieutenant Colonel Namenko. During the May Day holidays in the regiment was held a meeting of young fighters from among the recent additions. They lined up in the open air, the weather was warm and sunny. I ordered to carry the guard's battle banner in front of the formation. You see on this banner embroidered in gold the words, For our Soviet motherland, began his speech to the newcomers. Guards Major Polterak, this is the motto of all Soviet soldiers. The guardsmen of our regiment fight under this motto. And Ivan Efimovich told the young soldiers about the feats performed by the soldiers only in recent days. At the observation post was a Komsomol member of the guard sergeant Vladimir Stepanov, a telephonist. With him was a young fighter, Maxim Pitt. This day was a baptism of fire for a newcomer with a somewhat strange surname. Fixing the damage to the communication line, these soldiers had to crawl most of the time to be less conspicuous. However, this time the Germans noticed the communicators and opened fire on them. Stepanov managed to take cover in the trench, and his young partner also rolled down there. Six German soldiers were coming to the trench. When they came almost close, Stepanov and Pitt opened fire. Three Hitlerites killed Stepanov, the fourth, drink, the rest preferred to get away. When Tashlik was occupied, the commander of the battery of 76 millimetre guns, guards Senior Lieutenant Kotlin, asked me to go to his native village, which was in the neighbourhood. A day later he returned, but not alone, but with his 17-year-old younger brother. I authorised to enrol him in one of the gun crews of this battery. On the same day, an enemy bullet cut short the life of the elder brother. In Tashlik, on the square in front of the school, at a fresh grave, the younger Kotlik swore to avenge the enemy for the death of his brother. And about it, the deputy told the young soldiers. On the exploits of fellow soldiers in the battles on the Dniester bridgehead, notified the soldiers' flyers, political workers, deputy commander of the 1st Rifle Battalion, guards senior lieutenant B.P. Pavlov, who recently returned to the regiment after hospitalisation, told the soldiers about a fighter from the new replenishment of the guard's private juba. In the first battle, he seized a German machine gun and with the accurate fire from it pinned a group of Hitlerites to the ground when they tried to counter-attack. The enemy sniper did not give an opportunity to establish communication between the companies. Guards Private Troyanovsky tracked down the carefully camouflaged sniper and hit him with an accurate rifle shot. Pavlov found time to talk to the marksman, praised him. In the first days of May, the division, as part of the entire 5th Guards Army, was transferred to Romania, in the area of Botoshani, having made a 300-kilometre march through Ribnitsa, Balti, Falesti, crossing the Prut and coming to Seret for nine days. During this march, it became known that after a powerful assault, Sevastopol was liberated. The whole Crimea became Soviet again.